Hey, welcome to the one within all. Here we are. Another live episode of Interverse. Really happy to see everybody who's piling into the chat. We are joined by my good friend Eileen McCusick of the Biofield Tuning Store, teacher of <laughs> harmony and all around amazing Libran leader of thought in the realms of holistic health. And I'm super excited to be connecting with her again. This is her third time around on the show, and I highly recommend going back to some of the previous episodes that we've done together because one, some of the uh, basics will have been covered in those conversations, and today's maybe going to be a little more freewheeling and fun. I'm super excited for this one. A lot of people that I see in the chat here are people that we've done tunings together, so love that. Thanks, everybody. And Eileen, it's so good to see you again after last month getting to hang out at Music and Sky. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, that was really fun. Wasn't a chance to hang out. That was such a wonderful festival, uh, such great people and great minds. Um, I want more of that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to talk about it a little bit, actually, since I've got you here and I haven't really spoken too much about what we got up to there in the show anyway. So <laughs> how did you, you know, how did you uh, like it? Tell me some of the highlights for you, other than the fact that it was your birthday <laughs> and we celebrated birthday. together. Yeah. Well, you know, I did something there that I've never done before. And so, uh, you know, I'm often doing things I've never done before, but this was a particularly special one because it was the first time I'd ever uh, to a group done. I've, I've done lots of group tunings, obviously lots of recorded ones, but I've done a lot of in-person ones. But that was the first time that I combined tuning with my other branch of work, sort of a new branch of work, um, which is the Sing the Body Electric work that I do with the Brothers Corin. And we co-created what we call the sonic anatomy, sort of discovered that different uh, sounds resonate in different parts of the body. And so I took everyone through group tuning and um, had them tone at the same time. And uh, to see like hundreds of people sort of bouncing up and down and making sound while I was tuning them was thrilling. <laughs> it was so exciting. And then at the end, everyone spontaneously sung happy birthday together to me, which was just, it was a, it was an incredible experience. And um, I want to do certainly more of that sort of thing. You know, I talk about how uh, we're always being told to sit down and shut up. Right. And even meditation is like sitting down and shutting up or even a, a bowl concert, you know, is more sort of like lying down and shutting up. And I think people who are really busy and talk a lot probably do need to sit down and shut up. But there's a lot of us, a lot of people that are holding a, a lot of sound, a lot of tension in their bodies and they need to move and make sound. And so um, so it's cool for me to do that. But I think it was also more than even the talks and the music and the presentations and the food and the scene. Um, I think for me, it was the community that I was really um, just so thrilled about. Like everybody was really healthy. It was like a community of healthy, uh, open hearted truth seekers uh, and freedom lovers. And uh, I remember saying at one point, like, I want this to be my village. <laughs> like, I want to live with, with these people. Um, so that that was just really nice. Everybody felt like old friends that I hadn't met yet, you know? I couldn't agree more. And <laughs> it's hard to even put it into words. It was like, we talked about this in the sort of live podcast panel that we had together about this idea of time and the subjective time of being at an event like that, it felt like a week or more rather than just a weekend. And so uh, I also want to touch on uh, at least maybe not touch on, but actually spent a lot of time talking about the sing the body electric work and that workshop that you did for us there, because I personally learned so much about <laughs> so much like crucial information that I've put into practice since then about how dissonance, like what dissonance is in terms of, you said the body holds a lot of sound. And I think that was one of the final keys to the puzzle for me to, to sort of really get over the whole judgment aspect of dissonance. Like this is bad. It's bad for me to feel bad or it's symptoms are bad. Like I, that's also very in, in line with the, uh alternative views against uh, not against but like instead of the germ theory about like symptoms and illness and disease and so the big takeaway for me to put it in a nutshell and i'd love to talk more about that 
uh, hear you talk more about this, I mean, is that the dissonance or the symptom or the <laughs> the difficulty is actually like a portal that if you go through it and let it happen, like the key is letting it happen. And that's the hard thing for the right brained, uh, I'm sorry, the left brained culture, <laughs> very like leaning to the right side. I need to force everything to work type of the uh, deal. Like I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Letting it happen, the relaxing aspect of it, just, okay, my voice is making some dissonant, weird wobble and warble. What if I just allow it instead of resisting it or holding it in because it sounds quote unquote wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, and that that's the essence of the the work that we do in Sing the Body Electric is actually, it's like we could talk it about like your body as a pipe organ and all different kinds of macro and micro traumas throughout your life have caused pipes to collapse, to shut down, to get clogged, to get rusty. And we end up only expressing, you know, just a few notes of our full potential because we've just been so shut down. I mean, we've really been, most people have just been silenced with their emotional expression, uh, silenced with speaking whatever their truth is in that moment. Um, speaking up for needs. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, sort of silent internal suffering and tension going on. And, and as a consequence, people aren't free to enjoy their voices. You know, we're really actually amazing instruments. And the point, I think, of being one of the points, like you can't really separate music from being human. You know, music is such an integral part of humanity. And so... <clears throat> To have so many people in our culture have the experience of their voice being shut down and not and this perfectionism, like you were speaking to, <clears throat> somebody goes to sing and it sounds funny, it just means that the pipe is clogged. And so what we do in the sonic anatomy work is we we make sounds from specific zones and you're just, there's no right or wrong. Like there's no tone to be in. It, it's a lot of like um, sandbox playing, but there is a structure. Like you resonate this tone here, like you resonate the sound ma in your spleen. And if you had a really difficult relationship with your mother, because the spleen is the organ that relates to mother, the liver relates to father and that's pa. Um, and, and you go to sound ma and it comes out, ma, <laughs> then you just keep make, you just keep adding air. It's really simple. And then you're just like, ma, ma, ma. <laughs> and, and that was like, you know, 30 or 40 people all together doing that in every different version of the sound ma imaginable. And then many other sounds. It was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the front of the, the throat is ha, right? I heard a story. I don't know whether it was you that told me that chance, but when we got to the part at Music and Sky where we were working on the front of the throat and everybody was going ha, a whole bunch of people started laughing and making each other laugh, right? <laughs> and and that's, I mean, that's part of the release. Why laughter is like the best medicine it really releases energy from the throat. Ha. Yeah. I, I would really like to know if there's a place where the sonic anatomy and the sing the body electric work is available to look at in more detail. Is that like upcoming to be published? Like where are we at with that? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> well, we're finalizing our website. So uh, Sing the Body Electric just was recently born as its own entity because the Brothers Corrin have their whole thing that they do. And then I have biofield tuning and sort of my whole thing that I do. And we weren't even trying to, to create anything. Like there was never, we never got together the intention of creating this. I actually signed up with them to do this thing they call the Songwriter's Journey um, as, as an individual. To, they do it in classes, but they also work with individuals. And I signed up with them because I was terrified to sing in front of people. And I'm not, I'm one of those people, I'm not really afraid of much. I'm not afraid of other people. I've traveled by myself since I was 16 around the world. Um, but I had this kind of crazy inordinate terror around singing in front of people. Like I, I died horribly in multiple lives, you know, <laughs> for emoting in front of people. It was really gripping. Uh, and, your song is not pleasing to the Lord. Execute yeah, her. Exactly. I mean, and I think a lot of people can relate to that fear. I think, you know, throughout history, many people have been garroted, beheaded, strangled, you know, for 
for speaking the truth, for, for being visible. I think a lot of people kind of, you know, that's just a hurdle in the game of life. You just need to get over because uh, I think a lot of people encounter it. But um, but for me, it was really it was really tough. It was, you know, it was like that part of myself that uh, felt free to just be a natural singer comfortably, you know, a comfortable, natural human um, really got very buried, you know, from trauma. A lot, I had a whole bunch of kind of difficult things early on and trauma causes us to splinter and then take those parts of ourselves that were really wounded and they tend to get tucked really far away. And so my own healing journey has also been a journey to recover that part of me, that most kind of central, authentic self. And for a long time, I felt like I was just sort of orbiting around the edges and really missing crucial information. And I realized I needed help and that, you know, getting over this terror was was the road to do that. So we were um, they were going to help me to uh, write, co-write and record a few songs just as an exercise in getting over it. Um, but we started working together and then COVID happened and I couldn't get back to California. I was stuck in Jamaica. And so we just kind of ended up kind of extending what we were doing, but just very organically. And I think it was for me because they had, or were already working with people with this idea of an instrument and like, you know, sounding more from your body. Um, and, but I was like, oh, cause I understand the biofield anatomy too, right? My, my whole work with tuning forks and kind of understanding where patterns of tension are held in the body and what that relates to sort of mentally and emotionally. So a very, um, I don't know, kind of in-depth internal understanding of patterns of tension. And so I kept finding areas and it just kind of went on and on. And in the process of being like, oh, I'm like this down in here is stuck. And we were like playing around with sounds to get it to open. And so this whole body of work, um, we have 12 tones that go, um, one goes down, wah goes out of the tailbone and E goes up out the top of the head. And then there's five front going ones and five back going ones. So those are the 12 tones. And then we've got uh, something like 20 demitones that resonate in the body um, in all of these different places. And then, and the foot has actually three sounds and the foot is very complex, right? So there's a whole thing there and we can go through some, um, but let me just paint the big picture first. Uh, and then we also discovered that there are five zones. And so we have people make tones in different zones. And when we start off, this is so fun. When we start off um, on a workshop, because what we've been doing mostly is just a two day virtual workshop. But at the beginning, we have everybody sing happy birthday to themselves. And then we go through two days of like really exploring, cleaning out your pipes, moving from different zones. We have some other stuff that we do as well. I tune everybody up. And then at the end, and we don't sing any songs at all. And then at the end, we have everybody sing happy birthday to themselves again. And the difference is phenomenal. Like what the, the, what happens is people enjoy singing. They expand out into their voices. They play with it. They play joyfully with their own human instrument. They're like, oh my God, I can sing, right? Because it's not about how you sound or how you look. It's about the joy of expression. And, and so people get liberated into that in just seven hours. They're like, whoop, I'm liberated. And then that applies all over your life. You know, the stories that we've heard from people who've, who've experienced this and, uh, and the way that they start expressing themselves more freely, more comprehensively, um, more joyfully, even in other parts of their lives, right? It's, it's by our word that we create our life, right? You know all about words, <laughs> chance. And so when you're, when the whole throat and body gets liberated, um, you bring a lot more of you into what you create. So good. So good. Like I enjoy words. I even, <laughs> I wasn't even sure if it was maybe a good idea or not, but when I titled this episode, I put in there concordium e dissonantia per vocum, vocum. Or yeah, I wanted to ask you what Latin. that meant. <laughs> that means essentially like the closest translation would be creating harmony through dissonance or from dissonance with the voice. Hmm. Because that was the big thing I learned from that experience at music and sky. And I'd been experimenting a little bit before that. Uh, and I want to, I want to return to that, but I just, before I want to, um, 
no, I'll go ahead and get into that now. So like a, a few weeks before Music in Sky, I was going to go on this radio show where I was start. We was going to start at like 11 or 12 at night, which is quite a bit later than I'm usually comfortable with being in a flow state. And that day I was having like some major detox sniffles, vocal in, uh, problems from that. Like my whole face was not feeling good. So I grabbed, I grabbed my big fork right here. The fun one. You don't need a fork this big to do what I'm about to describe. You probably <laughs> don't even need a fork. You could probably do it in a lot of ways, but I would play this fork and kind of hold it towards my throat. And then I would let my voice try, like I would just seek to harmonize my voice with the sound of the fork. And it wasn't coming out strong. It wasn't coming out well, but I would just let it happen and let my voice go. And instead of trying to force my voice into harmony, I would sort of just watch it happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's the sort of distinction that's a little bit of a tricky mental piece. If you're like, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, that's because you're trying to do it. <laughs> and anyway, uh, I experimented with this. I would go up and down the register, like low, a little higher, a little higher, a little higher, kind of like um, octaves. And by about 20 minutes of doing this, my voice was so strengthened that I went and my energy was in such powerful flow that I went on that radio show and it was like I hadn't been ill at all. And my ability to deliver a message and communicate in flow was like super powerful. I was really into it. And so I, that was when it struck me. I was like, okay, <laughs> we have some serious power to adjust ourselves through the voice as if like, and that's why I got the G with the, in terms of what, like, which fork would I get? Cause these are expensive and I can only get one. I got the G note, which is supposedly going to correlate to the throat. And, uh, <laughs> that was like the best choice ever. I realized because every energetic center in the body can express what it needs to express in terms of like harmonizing itself through the voice. It's like a super powerful portal. So to then go and get the information of, <laughs> of the sonic anatomy in, in, in piecemeal. Cause I couldn't remember every part of it, but I was able to take that like after the workshop at music and sky and uh, like for a few clients, there would be a point where something wasn't really moving in terms of some stuck energy. Like I think she's in the chat right now. One of the people who that <clears throat> I did this with, and there was some stuck energy in the back of the heart chakra, like feeling uh, attacked by other people's negative energy Unexpre uh, I think unexpressed anger. I think it was just all, all around some heart chakra stuff, but I had her start doing the roar, <laughs> which is a really fun one, you know, especially because uh, I don't know if this was part of your thinking or it led to the discovery, but Leo in the astrology is the heart of medical astrology. So roar for the heart chakra kind of makes sense on a lot of levels, but I had her start doing the roar and it was obvious that a lot of energy was moving because even though she wasn't tired or anything during the RARs, she couldn't stop yawning. She'd be like mid, oh, like something was happening big time. And anyway, that's been really helpful. And so uh, whenever this work comes out in more depth, like that's going to be something in my toolkit of, you know, how, how about you help me move this stuck energy? And also you get the clue of like, if you're ever running into this issue again for yourself outside of getting a tuning session, you know, the sound that's going to be most helpful for moving that stock energy. So, yeah, you know. yeah. I got a great story about that, but I do, I want to finish the thought I had earlier when you asked me about it. So, um, so our sing the body electric.com website should be live in a week or two. And that um, kind of explains the whole program. And it'll also have our upcoming engagements. So um, we're going to be at Kripalu for anybody who knows that sort of thing. Uh, Kripalu is in Western Mass. And it's a good place to go because it's not that expensive to stay there. Um, June 30th to July 2nd. So, But I know we're going to be adding a bunch more. So both virtual and in person. And I definitely recommend uh, doing it. I mean, for anybody, really for anybody, you don't have to be, you certainly don't have to be a singer. You're going to have no experience. You can have advanced experience. You can just be a human being wanting to be more free. And, um, and what you're, what this is, is exactly what you just said, Chance. It's an, it's a way to self-regulate without any external thing. I mean, I've got 20 tuning forks 
sitting next to me. And tuning forks are great. You know what I mean? They definitely help, but I don't always have a fork. Not everybody can afford a fork, you know? So what can you do with your voice? And so Torald Korn, who's Isaac and Torald Korn, the brothers Korn, Torald has a daughter who's seven and they used to have this problem with her whenever they went in the car on any kind of road trip that she would get really sick and she'd throw up and she had just terrible motion sickness. And so what they started doing was going through the sonic anatomy in the car and especially the tone U, which is the front of the belly. And so the whole family would tone in the car with her, you, you, and they just kept doing it. And then they were able to move to other ones. And basically like she figured out how to use her own voice to self-regulate motion sickness. And to me, a seven as a seven-year-old, yeah, I mean, obviously informed by you know her dad, who kind of does this work. But you know, the fact that she was able, to, she, it was her idea somehow, I think, to to do this. And and she told her family like what she needed and how long they needed to do it for, and you know, told so. So at seven to figure out that you can self-regulate your own body with sound, that you don't need, you know, the patch or the pill or the ear thing, or, you know, you don't need anything outside of yourself. Just your own voice for self-regulation is huge. I mean, that is such empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. And for a seven-year-old, what, like, what really is incredible about that is her whole life, she's going to have that tool. I often imagine, you know, I mean, I don't regret my life at all. I'm happy with the path I've taken. But, you know, if I started my life w with these insights, imagine what kind of development and maturity could have, you know, by 30 years old, a person could be so far along because we, we're in a world right now to, to be honest and brutal about it. <laughs> you know, it's a bunch of babies and adult bodies because they're actually carrying around with them, shoved off to the side somewhere the identity of a hurt toddler or a hurt eight-year-old or something and so you know whenever the right trigger occurs that eight-year-old comes out and they're acting childish in a way that is not appropriate and you know overreacting because it's actually something much deeper and older that is being aggravated oh especially in relationships right i mean i really see that in biofield tuning we have a, an approach where we have what I call a relationship session. And I have people sit in chairs facing each other. And then I come in with a fork and I come and I comb through and read their group, their combined field and how their own energies are interacting. And pretty much every problem that the two adults having who are sitting there facing each other were had by their kid. And it was an unsolvable problem by their, their own inner child, not their birth child, but their own inner child was still stuck with the parents that didn't listen and the needs that weren't getting met. And, and you just take that distortion of that unsolved problem of that, that tension and that drama that is in your memory banks, that's in your field, and you just overlay it onto your partner. And it's still the same, the same problem. And maybe that's been going on for generations too. You know, so it's certainly um, a pattern both ancestrally, but also culturally, like our whole culture is engaged in the same kind of sickness. Like you said, it's all that everybody's adults, but they're sort of trapped in the pain bodies of of their inner children of those wounds that never got healed. Uh, that sounds really cool. I've never thought about relationship tuning sessions before, but one yeah. experiment that I've done. Uh, like after Music and Sky, I went and visited my friends Buffalo and Legs, those are screen names, <laughs> uh, not their real human names, but they have a show called False Reality Check, really good people. We visited them in Idaho after Music and Sky, and we were on this hike, and I had my fork with me, and I thought, like, you know what would be a really cool experience for them? I had, I had them hold it between them, and I struck it, and had them just make, like, uninterrupted eye contact while doing that process I described earlier of just letting their voice naturally find the harmony with the tone coming out of the fork. And so they did that for like several minutes <laughs> and it was psychedelic level of like, you know, looking into the soul portals of the eyeballs and being immersed in this coherent sound that you're harmonizing together with. It's like really can bring some people together that were, you know, they were already close and well together, but the possibilities are endless. It gets very, you know, it 
quickly can lead to some expanded consciousness experiences once you get past sort of the grime that needs to be worked out of the pipes, as you say. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, in September, <clears throat> um, the, the brothers and I were together in the same space leading the class for the first time. We'd done three virtually where they were in California and I was in Vermont. And uh, in September, I went to Ojai where they are. And, um, and of course, we came up with a whole new thing because we're just so like insanely creative together. Like there's almost this feeling like we're remembering this material from past lives together. Like, there, you know, we've, we've felt that from the very first moment we met, like we were old, old, old kin and, um, and that we've already done all this. And so it's just it seems to be something that's being remembered and brought back into the world. Like this is the lifetime where you did the setup work and this is a lifetime where the world is configured in such a way that you can share it with like the whole world once you remember yeah. it. Yeah. And it seems that way. And like people are really ready for this. You know, like one of the things that amazed me that I really didn't expect um, after my presentation on Saturday morning at Music and Sky, there were a number of spontaneous groups that just got together and started toning with each other. People would, you know, go past me and be like, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was really just interesting to see how spontaneous um, you know, emoting was just happening with everybody after that. And I think a lot of people brought that home and, um, you know, started doing it more because it, because it feels good. There's just something about that, that the body, it just, it helps you to relax. Like it's like, we're, it took me a long time to see this, right. But <clears throat> when I come through fields and I encounter resistance, it's usually some kind of memory where we had some kind of trauma response where we went into, into tension and resistance of what was going on. So the more trauma that we've had, the more we find resistance in the field, but also tension in the body, right? And so biofield tuning is really just a process of like finding these areas through the field. You know, it's going on the field, it's going on in the body and getting it to relax. You know, just that that, that trauma that was holding you there. That's, this was a big part of why I wasn't able to sing was because I had so many layers of tension in my body. It really took decades of biofield tuning, of body work, of um, and then this sing the body electric work that really helps you open from the inside. Like it's one thing to get a tune up from the outside, but it's a whole other thing to like create that space within you from the inside. Right. And then as you've discovered, when you pair them, you know, when you're getting tuned from the outside and sounding from the inside, um, it really makes things it makes things move. But what is it moving and what's coming out? Right. It's very often it's sound because very often in trauma, like in a rape or in a, a, a sudden car accident or something like that, you don't you, you don't emote. You just kind of hold it all in. Like most, if you think about, or like your alcoholic father storming around the house, you know, and, and being in contraction, um, that it's all of these experiences of going into tension and not making sound that when part of the relaxing process, if you can add sound, if you can let the sound that was trapped there also come out, then you really, that you, this is real healing. You know, because any place where you have that kind of tension, you're going to get inflammation and then that creates an excess in one place and a deficiency in another. And then you just start to spiral out of balance. <clears throat> but the more you can be free with with letting out these trapped sounds, uh, the, just the more free you become, the, the lighter and the easier it is to be in flow. Yeah, I like what Stacy says here. I'm working my way back into being noisy again, <laughs> making weird noises, toning, humming, singing, etc. Decades of people shutting me down. Unlock that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then at the end of the day, it's more the voice in your head that you imagine other people thinking about you <laughs> than it is people shutting you down. Like maybe you did get shut down by a parent here or there, but we create this artificial intelligence in our own mind of uh, at some point in childhood where it's like, this is how other people are seeing me. And now it's like this installed character that doesn't exist. That's watching you that <laughs> with a judgmental eye, but it's really you doing it to you anyway. Uh, what, what I think is so awesome about your journey to learning how to sing is that it's really a reflection of the human birthright at our core as these electric tonal frequency beings that are 
you know, created in the image of the entire fractal of the universe. <laughs> like we are like the entire universe as a, a human being. It's incredible to be able to recover that joyful expression of sound and not judge it, let it happen. Uh, there's just something about that that's miraculous. And I think maybe we're getting close to the core of what it is to be human whenever we're finally able to cut loose and freely sing like that, you know? Well, I think so. And I think part of the reason why people like really struggle with the noise in their heads is because because it's all internalized energy that isn't finding expression. And so it just runs around in circles in judgment or guilt or, you know, attack defense dynamics. And there's all kinds of ways that our mental body can, can be like a bad dog inside of our own head, you know, and really, you know, having treated thousands of clients that see that that's really what seems to create the most problems for people is the sort of undisciplined, unbalanced mental body that's trying to manage the emotions that haven't been able to be released from the physical body. Well, that, so, can I add to that too, uh, that, you know, you an undisciplined mental body, there's a lot of ways to discipline the mind, but I will say that also it's like, it can be easy. <laughs> like all of this, I think the, the key is that we're learning that it can be easy to be in flow, easy to be healthy. It's more about letting it happen. And with the mind, I've come to treat it like that it's this pattern recognition device, but it's more like a kid that loves games. And if it doesn't have a game that has been given, it's going to try to come up with one. So like if you're holding tension in your body, you're stressed, you're, you know, feeling bad in some place of the body. Basically what it does is it tries to come up with a story that explains why you feel this way. <laughs> and uh, that's usually not a very helpful story. It has something to do with like, it's an external thing's fault. And anyway, what I have what I like to instruct people, like if they get, say I'm running into the, uh, the torturous to-do list of the back right of the root chakra, where their head's just running through all the like, I gotta do this and then I gotta do that. And it's very unproductive and spending a lot of energy in that mental plane. Ask your mind, to play the game of look for the pattern of when I'm torturing myself with a to-do list. Tell me when I'm, when the pattern shows up and then now the mind is working for you. <laughs> you know, it's playing the game that you gave it. It's still doing what it does looking for a pattern, but now it's like helping you instead of hurting you with the, uh, the game. It's just, it just wants something to do. Yeah. I definitely have described it like a, you know, and if you have an Australian cattle dog that are really smart and they love to work and they love to have tasks and you leave them in an apartment all day, they're going to eat the furniture. It doesn't mean that they're a bad dog. It just means that they needed work to do. Right. And so I think that that is, it's a good analogy for what goes on in people's minds is the sort of, yeah, wanting to do work, wanting to solve problems, wanting to figure out stuff. Um, and then it, and then, but it, it can just become twisted, you know, when you get your bio field in a bunch, it all just be, can become distorted and not healthy. Um, but what you said, Chance, and, and I've been really feeling this way too. And I, I don't, I want to be careful to not be sensitive to where people are at. You know, I, I've been on this path of healing for a really long time and I've invested a lot of time and energy. I've gotten a lot of tune-ups, but I also really am coming to see that healing doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to take so long. When we understand one, that we're we're all carrying multi-generational trauma. And so, you know, what you think is wrong with you, um, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just downstream of a whole lot of trauma in a really messy environment. And it, it is really difficult. And anybody who's trying to get healthy and, and really get clear has, has said yes to really carrying a heavy load. Like this is a big, it's, it's a, it's heavy lifting to, to do this. But at the same time, there's so many resources available and I've really come to the conclusion and I, I welcome pushback on this, um, that pretty much everything that we suffer from mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally, whatever, what have you spiritually is tension based. It's just some part of you that's tense. And, and when you're really sick, you're very complexly tense. And when you're tense, what happens is 
blood doesn't flow to those areas. Lymph isn't moving very well. Electricity and information isn't flowing. You're not breathing. You're not getting sufficient oxygen. That's cancer can grow in environments like that. So that healing is really, like you said, it's not even trying. It's like just relaxing down into who we are and we're okay, you know, like in this moment. And so the, the more you can recognize like what you said about getting your brain to like notice when you're doing that, the more you can become aware of whenever you're going tense or holding tension. And I was just doing it in a car with my husband we were driving along and I was holding my phone and all, all of a sudden I realized I was holding my breath and I had tension in my forearms. I was like, oh, look, tension. And I just let it go. So, you know, if you want to boil health down to like its very simplest essence, like flow is not tense. I mean, there, there's a tensile integrity in healthy flow, but it, it's tension in all the right places, right? You don't want to be a blob of, of no tension at all. But learning how to, you know, when the mind is running a to-do list, there's a tension there. Like, what is the tension? Like, what are you afraid of? Where is this tension coming from? You know, oh, I feel guilty if I'm not productive. And so that guilt is hammering into my hip and my brain is doing this. I'm like, right. And so you got to sit back and like question that, that mind, that structure, you know, that judge and be like, where is even any of this coming from? And do I even need to be doing this? No. And then making a different choice right? So good. Yeah. And a lot of it is just the choice part makes a huge difference. One of the things that is really helpful for me as a practitioner is that, you know, I do a lot of like setting the intentions very clearly. This is exactly what we're doing. <laughs> you know, this, these are the energies that are welcome. These are unwelcome. These are our defined boundaries. But I also make a point to talk to the protective layer of the client's psyche which is I conceptualize a layer of ourself that holds us back from feeling or remembering certain types of traumas or emotions because it thinks it's going to interfere with our daily life, you know, survival needs or what we have on our agenda. <laughs> so I, I talk to that part of our, of their self and I say, give your job over to their higher self for, for this session. But also we make the uh, distinction of like whatever is remembered or felt or whatever energy we're integrating doesn't actually have to be viscerally felt or remembered. It can be, but we're inviting it to come in as a, in a more objective, pure witness type of way. And it works every time that like, even if we do hit into some kind of like, whoa, that's some gnarly experience that we're pulling out there. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't like come through with like they're sobbing and they're falling to pieces. It's more like they're seeing it in a, a witness level and it, Really, a lot of this stuff just needs to be noticed <laughs> that it's been hidden and the noticing of it, you know, sometimes I can just move the stuck energy in their field back to center and then it's good. But other times, no matter what I do with the fork, it's not changing. That spot of distance is there until I say, OK, here's a feeling. It's this type of feeling. It's this time of your life, uh, uh, roughly. And I'm going to need you to tell me out loud <laughs> what comes to mind. And then when they do, then all of a sudden it moves and, and sometimes they'll tell me more and stuck energy from other parts. Like I do some diagnostic stuff. I use dowsing rods and I measure the energy body left, right, front, back before we even start. So I kind of have a map of what places we're going to hit in the hour. And sometimes whenever they do verbalize what it was, it, we may have been working in the sacral chakra, but that will unblock a corresponding pocket of energy in on a higher chakra and we don't even really have to work that the same way so the noticing and expressing and just saying it out loud like how many things happened to you as a kid that you know about and you're like yeah i'm fine with that but did you ever say it out loud because there's something about that taking it from in to out that really dissipates the uh the strength of of whatever it was Definitely. Confession is good for the soul. I mean, you know, that that's obviously been my experience too in biofield tuning and combing that for the most part, I, I will, if I get stuck, I'll ask people where they notice it in their body. You know, I'll just make it a somatic experience. Um, but I've definitely found that if I, something doesn't want to move, it really needs to be witnessed. It wants and needs to be witnessed. And I can't tell you how many people have said the phrase to me, I've never told anyone this before, but 
da 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 da, you know, or I've seen get uncovered in classes. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, it relates to sexual abuse. Like there's there's a lot of that. A lot of people's pelvic trauma, low back pain, lower GI, reproductive issues are, are very often tied to attention as a consequence of some, you know, boundary trespass. And that tension is still kind of locked in there. Um, attention dissolves a tension. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It is true. It, that attention and that being witness, that somebody there with you witnessing it, no judgment, just totally safe. Be like, yeah, you had that experience. And, you know, let's just be with the pain of that and then allow that, you know, we're not getting rid of anything. I think it's really important to, to you know, on a certain level of life, we're indelibly impressed and we can't get rid of anything. You know, I mean, I'll tell people like, you know, that wound that you have because you were an unmothered child is never going to go away. <laughs> like we can't get rid of that. You have to learn to live with the fact that you were an unmothered child. You have to relax into the reality that that was that. And nobody's ever going to come along and fill that hole. Like your mom didn't fill it. Nobody else is going to fill it. You can't even really fill it. You have to accept that life, you know, we all have these parts in our lives that, you know, like really impressed us and maybe put a hurting on us and healing is, is being willing to accept instead of resent, re resist, reject, judge, but suffer. Uh, uh, you know? Like we can be in our suffer and our struggle and our story all we want, but it is what it is. And so what we're really doing with sound is we're just assisting the body to relax into that acceptance. So whatever, whatever, you know, wherever we had our biofield in a bunch because of that unwelcome input that we tensed up to, we can relax that. We don't take it away. We just, we, we, we help relieve the tension that's holding it. But that experience is always going to be there. It's just, but, but that tension gets charged to it as well, right? So that's where triggers come in because when you're holding that tension, you've got that charge and someone comes along and triggers it, then you're like, ah, you know, you're the eight-year-old that's, that's having a fit because, uh, because you've been triggered, right? So the trick, it, it's really just to relax and even just mentally, right? Even when I'm talking, maybe people are like kind of mentally accepting things that have happened in your life instead of holding resistance against it, you know, or lack of forgiveness or, you know, forgiveness is a really big part of it. And, and just forgiving God, you know, when, when you're holding a, a grievance against a particular person, or you think that something shouldn't have happened that way, or they shouldn't have done that, or that was wrong, you're really holding resistance to the entire universe. You're judging the entire stream of life because everything's connected to everything else. So holding a judgment or a resistance in your field is trying to hold back life itself. So, you know, even if they didn't deserve to be forgiven, your body deserves to be released from that tension. And, you know, we don't understand the bigger picture of why things happen and what karma is and all that. So we really can't, I think. Uh, you know, there's no justification for holding on to that judgment and tension because we only know our side of the story, really. So true. And one of the upsides of the fact that the wound, you know, in your past, there's always maybe going to be a little blip there or it's a part of you forever is that whenever you do release the tension of it, you're fully aware of it. And as part of your configuration as a being, now you have the opportunity to be one of the best possible candidates to help others through that exact same thing. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, some of the best healers I know are people who've, you know, wow, you read their field and the stories and what they've experienced. Um, you know, if you've had a pretty easy life and everything's kind of come easily to you and you haven't had a lot of suffering and struggling, you're, you're not going to be a, a good empathetic container, you know, to to be with. I mean, I've, I've been through, you know, all, all, some really difficult stuff. Um, certainly not compared to some of the people that I've listened to, you know, it, you see people walking down the street and you're like, oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> or I'd see somebody walk into my office. They'd seem like such a, you know, normal, well-adjusted human. And then I'd listen into their field about what their parents did to them or, you know, what ma marriages and like the incredible, horrible things that humans can do to each other and the incredible suffering that we can bear, but still be resilient. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. And a lot of times the stuff 
especially further back, like pre-memory time, it, it's hard to pinpoint without somebody reading your field, as you say. An example would be I had a client where we were really working with left side of the body issues, receptivity, fertility, everything yin. And when it came down to it, the biggest blip, if you will, was in the back of the left side of the solar plexus, I right near the edge of the field, right near the boundary. So like baby age, I, I hit this spot and all of a sudden in my mind, I just got this flash of like, where's mom? Where, where's mom? And I tell this to her and uh, she's like, you know, when I was a baby, my mom had, she, she wasn't connecting this dot because her mom was great. She loved her mom. Her mom loved her. They had a great relationship. Great mom. But I hit this spot and she was like, yeah, my mom had postpartum depression when I was a baby. And for the first year or two of my life, I was mostly being cared for by my dad because she was dealing with that. And in our current age of like so much birth trauma is for the mother as much as for the baby, the way hospital births go. You know, we talk about that stuff on the show all the time. Uh, what occurs is this belief gets set as an infant of I don't deserve nurturing. I have to do it all myself. I have to care for myself. I have to soothe myself. And then that totally jacks up the whole flow of receptivity in the end for the body. Like, you know, it might not seem apparent, but like for her, this was leading her to like right wrist and hand carpal tunnel and like way over using the right side of the body. The whole gamut of possible issues with this right left thing being unbalanced. So getting that awareness of like, oh, it was baby me setting the belief that I don't deserve to be nurtured. You know, I, I'm excited to hear back from this friend in the future about like, you know, how that's affected her level of receptivity in the world. Yeah, it's so formative. And and that, I think that is one of the coolest things about this work is that ability to go into that like precognitive zone and determine like, oh, there's birth trauma or mom wasn't there or, because we do on Earth 3 form some very key beliefs about ourselves and our relationship with the world and the people around us. And they can, you know, absolutely impact us. I remember working on this guy once and he had been involved in the human potential movement really from the beginning. Like he, he, you know, he was in his sixties, he'd been really involved and he really thought that at this point in his life, he would have, he would have been more successful. And so when I was reading his field, like everything from three down was completely related to self-worth. Uh, but it, he didn't remember any of that, but he had done so much work. I've never encountered a field like this where like from three to, to present day was all clear. Like he had literally like, you know, made use of all of these different techniques for clearing, for clearing, for clearing, for clearing. And he didn't understand why he wasn't successful, but he hadn't gotten to that precognitive formative stuff that was all related to self-worth. And so I adjusted in there and, um, and then just apparently shortly at, well, he told me he didn't, he didn't feel anything from it, but his wife told me that shortly after that, he got a really good job offer and he didn't connect it to <laughs> what we did, which I found really interesting. Um, but yeah, and you know, you're, you're never going to get to that stuff sitting around in therapy talking about it because you have no idea. And those beliefs that we form, you know, like a baby that's left to cry it out, forms this belief, like nobody cares what I have to say. It doesn't matter what I say, like my needs aren't going to get met or, you know, kind of like what happened with your client. And, and then you carry that your whole life and, and it informs your tone of voice. So that's kind of interesting when you have a belief that nobody cares what you have to say, that's going to come out in your voice so that people are going to subconsciously hear that tone and respond to it and be dismissive of you. Right? Or, yeah, you're just getting heard. interrupted all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because because that's you, your tone is carrying that belief. This is the thing about our voices is that because your vagus nerve right informs your vocal cords and it's connected to all the organs in your body. We don't just hold tension in our muscles. Anybody who's received a biofield tuning session usually has the experience of your stomach starts gurgling because you're holding tension in your viscera, in your gut, in your different organs. And so any beliefs, any everything really is coming out on your voice and people are responding to all that subconscious information. 
Yeah, I've seen the whole gamut of uh, things happening in people's body during tunings, like burping, <laughs> needing to go pee three times in the session, yawning, you know, all kinds of interesting energy movements, gurgling, tingling, right? What's fun is when you're remote and there's no cameras or anything and they're like, I feel a uh, tingling in my right knee and I will just be putting a fork around that spot. <laughs> the remote aspect of it is so cool. But what I want to say too, uh, especially in the first hour about why this is so useful and like what you've uh, helped the world with in terms of the biofield anatomy and this great roadmap is how as someone who's internalized this biofield anatomy, an example of what can happen when you know the, you know, what emotions are connected to what parts of the body and what type of experiences. Cause like you said, with the guy who got a good job offer, you know, it's a chicken or an egg scenario. It's not like I'm saying one causes the other. It's kind of like a mirror situation, but stuff that happens in the external world is really no different or not separate from the stuff going on in your energy body. It's all one thing. That's what a fractal is. So like I had this experience at the gym a couple of days ago where I was doing some lifts and like I knew the next one was going to be too hard, but I pushed through anyway. And I felt this like, oh, strain, hurt, back, right shoulder, uh, <clears throat> neck to shoulder dynamic. So, you know, I immediately, I immediately pretty much knew I'm like, okay, this has to do with the throat, heart, chakra, uh, boundary you know, it's crossing over into both of these places. And it wasn't long before I realized, yeah, I had just gone through some, uh, something with a friend that hurt my feelings and made me angry. And I hadn't fully expressed the anger of that. And, you know, it all, there was an external situation that completely reflected the, uh, injury that I just got <laughs> in my body. And so then as I like, I just allowed myself to notice the mirroring of that. And then, you know, later that night, when I was talking about it with my partner, I'm expressing this, then the uh, sadness of the situation actually welled up and I felt the emotion of it and I expressed it out loud. And, you know, the, <laughs> the coalescing and the healing of that injury, like the next morning, it was way, way, way better. And, you know, it still takes a couple of days to get over an injury, no matter what. But the point is that like knowing, I'm pretty sure that knowing the biofield anatomy like that was why I didn't just move on and, you know, have a week or two weeks of a hurt shoulder and never feel the sadness. You know, I knew the anger was there, but there's always sadness underneath anger too. Yeah, yeah, there's sadness. And I actually felt it and I actually expressed it. I think it's because I knew that the situations correlate. It's like, becomes yeah. miraculous when you realize like even stubbing your toe means something. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that you're spot on with that. I think, you know, I had a similar experience happen with a sprained right ankle where, um, you know, usually I don't twist ankles, but I twisted my right ankle on this particular day, walking in boots on, on uneven surface in the ice and, um, and it swelled up. And, and, but I knew I was able to know exactly what it was related to because I had been trying to decide if I was going to fire this person or not. Nobody ever wants to fire anybody. And I was also trying to decide if I was going to go with a publisher or self publish my second book. And I'm a Libra, but I am not generally a ditherer. I don't tend to dither, I tend to know and act. And, but I was dithering on two subjects and that is so right foot, you know, and I was created an indecisive in my field with this indecisiveness. And then I wasn't able to re respond to the twist. Usually I'd be able to pull right out of something like that, but I was energetically already unstable there. Um, but I was able to heal it within just like a day of, I took a salt bath. I used the sonic slider. I let myself feel all the emotions and understand what it was about. And then it was almost instantly better. And I also had an experience, the exact same kind of thing of you at the gym where I was um, doing the medicine ball where you pick it up and you slam it in the ground, you bounce it and you catch it. And, and I would usually do like 14 pounds, but I was, I couldn't find it. So I was using the 20 pound one. And uh, on the last one, I kind of spent brained the out, I don't know, just some did something to hear on the, my right arm. So this is like being a caretaker, a caregiver, right? And it also can come up into resentment um, issues. And what happened was I, woke, I had baked a pie, an apple pie the day before, and I had a slice and I have my two young adult sons live with me. 
And I said to them both, I'm going to have a slice for breakfast. And when I woke up in the morning, the pie pan was empty. <laughs> like, so all I could do was assume that they had eaten the whole thing. And I couldn't believe that they didn't leave me a piece. And so I was feeling a little resentful and a little put out that I'd put all this effort and made the pie and it just got eaten and I didn't get another slice. But, <laughs> and then I got, you know, so I was a little bent, right, about that. And so that's exactly where, you know, I didn't do it on my left side. I wasn't really sad about it. I was just kind of like, what? I just put all the work in. <laughs> like, so, um, but then what ended up happening was I found out actually later when I went home that they didn't eat the whole pie, that actually a bowl fell out of the cabinet and smashed on it and covered it with tiny ceramic chips. And so they had to throw it away. And so then knowing, you know, I'm like, oh, that isn't what happened. Like I injured myself based on a, a false assumption, <laughs> right? Which is a lot of what we do too, to get out of balance. Um, it also healed very quickly. Like then, you know, within a couple of days it was, it was gone. So you got to watch out for those bolter guys <laughs> throwing bowls out of the cabinet. I, Such reminds a me of one time I uh, was with some friends at my house and I watched, we were watching and the cabinet door just opened and a coffee mug threw out and we're like, Hmm, that was weird. That is weird. <laughs> Don't know what to make of that. Uh, but yeah, this that's really important. I want people to know that like just studying the biofield anatomy, picking up Eileen's books, getting familiar with that, make a chart for yourself. You know, you don't have to have it memorized, but if you get hurt or you're feeling yeah. diseased, reference that and it can really help the whole process because awareness is the, you know, knowing is half the battle, like J. Joe says. But in the last couple of minutes here, before we switch over to our Rockfin Patreon second hour, uh, let's talk about where people can, you know, what's going on with the biofield tuning store, what kind of courses you're offering, you know, give the, give the folks like where they can get more of what you're doing or learn this stuff from the master. All right. Well, I found it's really interesting that you said that as a founder of the biofield tuning store, because I don't know, nobody's ever said that before the founder of the biofield tuning sound therapy method. I'm the founder of the biofield tuning Institute, which conducts grant funded, uh, ideally peer reviewed research. We're waiting to hear back from peer review right now about a study we did on anxiety um, that's been submitted for peer review. And we already have one published paper, so this would make it number two. Just working to, um, you know, bring science, science <laughs> to, the, to the whole um, biofield, the field of the biofield. Um, <clears throat> so the biofieldtuningstore.com um, has got all kinds of tuning forks and instructional videos. Um, it's got, uh, I've got a class coming up actually next week, um, a two hour virtual class called Ancestral Rivers and Mind Viruses. And I'm gonna be talking about how being downstream of all of this trauma has created these pattern, these tensions of pattern that kind of create loops that parasites feed on. And, um, and so, you know, if we wanna be sovereign, free human beings, we, free of the parasite class out there. Uh, we really have to be free of etheric and physical parasites in our body. Um, <clears throat> you know, but, but understanding like, again, coming into this healing doesn't have to be so hard to understand what's going on, practice energetic hygiene, delete mind viruses. You know, I'm trying to make healing as simple as possible for people. Um, and so you can find that at the biofield tuning store, sign up for that. Um, at biofieldtuning.com, you can, we have practitioners all around the world, um, that you can, uh, sign up with chance chance isn't certified, but he's a enthusiastic student, uh, in practice. And so I totally support that. You know, my book has all the information to do what, what chance is doing. <laughs> exactly. Know? The books were books and your talks. And I was like, ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, the most important thing is that healing is happening. You know what I mean? And so that's why I was kind of put the whole biofield tuning thing out kind of as shareware because uh, because it's so handy and you can take the premises and kind of plug it into other things too as well. Um, so, so yeah, biofieldtuning.com, biofieldtuningstore.com, YouTube. I've got a lot of videos on YouTube that you can check out and also on Facebook and Instagram. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, this has been really fun guys. And I want everyone to know we're going to keep going for another hour over on the Rockfin side. I'll post a link in the chat. We'll have about a four minute intermission with some music by my buddy, David, AKA wisdom traders while we, you know, take a little break, get ourselves a fresh beverage and we'll see everyone on the other side. 
Eileen, it's been really awesome to reconnect like this. I have a lot more on my note list to talk about, including, you know, more that idea about mind viruses and parasites and also have more questions about the sonic anatomy, which is probably the most exciting upcoming work that you've got, you know, in the oven that because like you said, it's shareware. <laughs> this is our human birthright. You know, we're rediscovering maybe something that in a earlier time humanity just sort of innately knew and we've gotten a bit distracted or, or misdirected by uh, faulty beliefs. So this has been awesome. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, everyone go check out the Biofield Tuning Store. Get a sonic slider. A lot better investment than Tylenol or <laughs> or some <laughs> kind of uh, pain medicine. You can do so much with it. It totally totally changed my life in ways that I did not expect when I started working on my left shoulder with the sonic slider and wound up det detached from all kinds of external situations that <laughs> were plaguing me. Yeah. Just like she's doing right there. It's super, super easy. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Eileen. Much love. We'll see you on the other side. Yeah, you bet. Oops, wrong one. Okay.